A 20-year-old Faith had just begun to recover from a series of successive blows when a terrible crisis shook it to its roots. Mirza Yahya, Baha'u'llah's half-brother, in the absence of Baha'u'llah from Baghdad, and even after his return from Suleymaniyya, brought shame upon the faith he was assigned to protect. He corrupted the Bab's writings, introducing a passage into the call to prayer in which he identified himself with the Godhead, and inserting references in those writings and nominating himself as the Bab's successor. He was also implicated in the assassination of Mirza Ali Akbar, the Bab's cousin, and in other acts which violated the honor of the Bab himself. Desperate designs to poison Baha'u'llah and his companions, and thereby reanimate his own defunct leadership, began to agitate his mind about a year after their arrival in Adrianople. Well aware that his half-brother, Akai Ikalin, was knowledgeable in matters of medicine, he, under various pretexts, sought information from him regarding the effects of certain herbs and poisons, and then began, contrary to his usual behavior, to invite Baha'u'llah to his home, where one day, having smeared his teacup with a substance he had concocted, he succeeded in poisoning him, causing a serious illness that lasted no less than a month, and which was accompanied by severe pains and high fever, which left Baha'u'llah with a shaking hand till the end of his life. Finally, Mirza Yahya's open rejection of the station of Baha'u'llah and his pitiful claim to be the recipient of an independent revelation was the signal for the final rupture between Baha'u'llah and Mirza Yahya, a rupture that marks one of the darkest dates in Baha'i history. Wishing to allay the animosity of his enemies and to assure to each one of the exiles a complete freedom to choose between him and Mirza Yahya, Baha'u'llah withdrew with his family to the house of Rida Big, which was rented by his order, and refused for two months to associate with either friend or stranger, including his own companions. He instructed Akai Ikalim to divide all the furniture and other effects found in his home, and sent half to the house of Mirza Yahya, to deliver to him certain relics he had long coveted, such as the seals, rings, and manuscripts in the handwriting of the Bab, and to ensure that he received his full share of the allowance fixed by the government for the maintenance of the exiles and their families. This split, in fact, consolidated Baha'u'llah's position as leader of the Baha'i community, while the public distinction between Baha'i identity and the Azalis, followers of Mirza Yahya, also known as Subi Azal, meant that he could deny any relationship to revolutionary or theocratic ideas still being put forward in those groups. After about one year, an event of great significance occurred, which proclaimed to friend and foe alike Baha'u'llah's triumph over his enemies. A certain Mir Muhammad, a Babi of Shiraz, who resented the claims and the cowardly seclusion of Mirza Yahya, succeeded in persuading Sayyid Muhammad to induce Mirza Yahya to meet Baha'u'llah face to face so that the truth might be publicly revealed. Foolishly assuming that his illustrious brother would never countenance such a proposition, Mirza Yahya appointed the Mosque of Sultan Salim as the place for their encounter. No sooner had Baha'u'llah been informed of this arrangement than he set out on foot in the heat of midday and accompanied by this same Mir Muhammad for the mosque, reciting verses aloud as he walked through the streets and markets in a voice and in a manner that greatly astonished those who saw and heard him. Mir Muhammad, who had been sent ahead to announce Baha'u'llah's arrival, soon returned and informed him that Mirza Yahya wished to postpone the interview. Upon returning to his house, Baha'u'llah revealed a tablet in which he recounted what had happened, fixing the time for the postponed interview, sealed the tablet with his seal, gave it to Nabil, and instructed him to deliver it to one of the new believers, 
Mulla Muhammad Tabrizi for the information of Sayyid Muhammad, who was in the habit of frequenting that believer's shop. It was arranged to demand from Sayyid Muhammad, before the delivery of that tablet, a sealed note pledging Mirza Yahya in the event of failing to appear at the designated place, to affirm in writing that his claims were false. Sayyid Muhammad promised that he would produce the document the next day, and though Nabil waited for three days in that shop for the reply, the Sayyid did not appear. Nabil, recording this historic episode 23 years later, affirms that the tablet was still in his possession, as fresh as the day on which Baha'u'llah had penned it, and the seal of the ancient beauty still adorned it. A tangible and irrefutable testimony to Baha'u'llah's ascendancy over a routed enemy. Baha'u'llah was, needless to say, acutely distressed by this episode. He laments, He who for months and years I reared with the hand of loving kindness hath risen to take my life. The cruelties inflicted by my oppressors have bowed me down and turned my hair white. And yet, years later, in the Kitabiyaktas, his most holy book, a forgiving Lord assures this same brother. Fear not because of thy deeds. Return unto God, humble, submissive, and lowly, and he will put away from thee thy sins. Thy Lord is the forgiving, the mighty, the all-merciful. Though he himself was bent with sorrow and still suffered from the effects of the attempt on his life, and though he was well aware that further banishment was impending, Baha'u'llah arose with matchless power to proclaim the mission with which he had been entrusted to those who in East and West held the reins of supreme temporal authority in their grasp. Day and night the divine verses were raining down in such number that it was impossible to record them. A number of secretaries were unable to cope with the task. Mirza Bakir i Shirazi alone transcribed no less than 2,000 verses every day. Every month, the equivalent of several volumes would be transcribed and sent to Persia. The copiousness of his writings during the Adrianople period alone, from late 1863 to the summer of 1868, is without equal in the annals of religion. By this time, the banner of the faith was planted by renowned disciples at the direction of Baha'u'llah, well beyond Persia, Iraq, and Turkey, to the Caucasus, Egypt, and Syria. Developments flowing from the proclamation of the faith, and from the internal convulsions which the cause had just undergone, did not escape the attention of its enemies. Emboldened by the recent ordeals with which Baha'u'llah had been so cruelly afflicted, these enemies began to demonstrate afresh their animosity. Persecution began once more to break out in various countries. In Azerbaijan, Persia, and Egypt, the adherents of the faith were imprisoned, vilified, penalized, tortured, or put to death. Mirza Hussein Khan the Persian ambassador in Constantinople, and his associates were no less active. They were well aware of the challenging tone Baha'u'llah had assumed in some of his newly revealed tablets, and were ever mindful of the instability prevailing in their own country. They were disturbed by the constant comings and goings of pilgrims in Adrianople, and by the exaggerated reports of Fuad Pasha, who had recently passed through on a tour of inspection. Irritated by the evident esteem in which Baha'u'llah was held by the consuls of foreign powers stationed in Adrianople, they determined to take drastic and immediate action which would extirpate that faith, isolate its author, and reduce him to powerlessness. The fateful decision was eventually arrived at to banish Baha'u'llah to the penal colony of Akka. This decision was embodied in a strongly worded firman issued by Sultan Abdulaziz. The companions of Baha'u'llah, 
who had arrived in the capital were arrested, interrogated, deprived of their papers, and flung into prison. Suddenly, one morning, the house of Baha'u'llah was surrounded by soldiers. His followers were summoned by the authorities, interrogated, and ordered to make ready for their departure. Most of their possessions were confiscated and auctioned at half their value. Some of the consuls of foreign powers called on Baha'u'llah and expressed their readiness to intervene with their respective governments on his behalf, offers for which he expressed appreciation, but which he firmly declined. Throughout his life of exile and imprisonment, Baha'u'llah never took advantage of the offers of personal protection extended to him on many occasions by sympathetic governments, since to do so would diminish his claim to spiritual sovereignty and ascendancy and abrogate his leadership of a defenseless, exiled community. The Persian ambassador promptly informed the Persian consuls in Iraq and Egypt that the Turkish government had withdrawn its protection from the Babis and that they were free to treat them as they pleased. On August 12, 1868, Baha'u'llah and his family, escorted by a Turkish officer and a contingent of soldiers, set out on a four-day journey to Gallipoli, on the first stage of a journey by land and sea to the prison city of Akka in the Turkish province of Syria. They rode in carriages and stopped on the way at Kashane, where the Sura Irais, the tablet of the chief, was revealed in Arabic. In it, Baha'u'llah admonishes Ali Pasha, the prime minister of the Sultan. Hast thou imagined thyself capable of extinguishing the fire which God hath kindled in the heart of creation? Nay, by him who is the eternal truth. On account of what thy hands have wrought, it blazed higher and burned more fiercely. Ere long will it encompass the earth and all that dwell therein. Thus hath it been decreed by God, and the powers of earth and heaven are unable to thwart his purpose. Upon his arrival in Gallipoli, Baha'u'llah made the following pronouncement to the Turkish officer, who, having discharged his duty, was about to take his leave. Tell the king, Baha'u'llah exclaimed, referring to Sultan Abdulaziz, tell the king that this territory will pass out of his hands, and his affairs will be thrown into confusion. Not I speak these words, but God speaketh them. With amazing prescience, Baha'u'llah had foreseen the impending fate of the Sultan, the provinces over which he reigned, and the very ground upon which they then stood. The Ottoman Turkish Empire, already in a long period of decline, lost more of its prestige and territory in the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-78. In the turbulent decade leading up to this watershed defeat, Turkey experienced a series of bloody revolts in its Balkan territories, and in 1876, only eight short years after Baha'u'llah's ominous warning, Sultan Abdulaziz, who, with Naziridin Shah, was the author of the calamities heaped upon Baha'u'llah, and was himself responsible for three decrees of banishment against the Prophet, who had been stigmatized in the Kitabi Akdas as occupying the throne of tyranny, and whose fall had been prophesied in the law Ifuad, was deposed in consequence of a palace revolt, was condemned by a fatwa of the Mufti in his own capital, was four days later assassinated, and was succeeded by a nephew who was declared to be an imbecile. The Russo-Turkish War of 1877-78 emancipated 11 million people from the Turkish yoke, and Adrianople was temporarily occupied by Russian forces. This was the beginning of the end for the Ottoman, but finally collapsed during World War I. After the war, Turkish nationalists deposed the Sultan. A secular republic was formed in 1923 under Kemal Ataturk, and in March 1924, the Turkish National Assembly abolished the Caliphate, the supreme secular and religious authority of Sunni Islam. A rulership that had endured for six centuries 
was ended. On numerous occasions, Baha'u'llah has demonstrated an amazing power to foresee the future. He himself writes, We have laid bare the divine mysteries and in most explicit language foretold future events. Many of the things which have come to pass on this earth have been announced and prophesied by the most sublime pen. All that hath been sent down hath and will come to pass, word for word, upon the earth. No possibility is left for anyone either to turn aside or protest. An objective examination of Baha'u'llah's striking prophecies in the light of subsequent events confirm his prescience and prophetic power. Turkey's Sultan Abdulaziz ruled the Ottoman Empire to which Baha'u'llah was banished in 1853 and in which he spent the remaining 40 years of his life. The Turkish government at first left Baha'u'llah in peace, but slowly came to regard him as a potential source of political unrest. Responding to this fear and to strong pressure from Persian authorities, the Sultan moved Baha'u'llah, his family and companions, to various places in the empire, ending with their confinement in the fortress prison of Akka. A number of women and small children, obviously innocent of any crimes against the state, were among the victims of this brutal repression. As these successive edicts of banishment were imposed, Baha'u'llah sent several strongly worded protests to the Sultan, directly and through various ministers of government. He condemned the injustice and cruelty of the orders, appealed without success for a ten-minute hearing to answer the charges against him, denied that he ever had sought or ever would seek to undermine imperial authority, he pointed out that his teachings require loyal obedience to established governments and counseled the Sultan to act with justice towards all his subjects. Two key players in this drama were the Sultan's top-ranking subordinates, Ali Pasha, the Turkish Prime Minister, and Fuad Pasha, Minister of Foreign Affairs. These powerful men did much to engineer the policy of suppression to which Abdulaziz gave his sanction. During his forced transfer from Adrianople to the prison at Akka, Baha'u'llah addressed a tablet to Ali Pasha called the Sura i Rais, stating that the Prime Minister soon would find himself in manifest loss. In 1868, shortly after arriving at Akka, he repeated this prophecy in a second letter to Ali Pasha and further reproved the entire Ottoman government. He wrote, Soon will he, God, seize you in his wrathful anger, and sedition will be stirred up in your midst, and your dominions will be disrupted. Then will ye bewail and lament, and will find none to help or succor you. Be expectant, for the wrath of God is ready to overtake you. Ere long will ye behold that which hath been sent down from the pen of my command. Shortly thereafter, in a widely circulated tablet called the Law i Fuad, Baha'u'llah again forecast the Prime Minister's downfall. This time, however, he expanded the prophecy to include Sultan Abdulaziz as well. Commenting on the premature death of Fuad Pasha in 1869, the tablet states, Soon will we dismiss the one, Ali Pasha, who was like unto him and will lay hold 
on their chief, Abdulaziz, who ruleth the land. And I, Verily, am the Almighty, the All-Compelling. This prophecy seemed so preposterous that a distinguished Islamic scholar and cleric, Mirza Abul Fadl, seized upon it as a chance to discredit Baha'u'llah. He pointed out that the expression lay hold on is a figure of speech that in the tablet's original language signifies violent and untimely death as a result of divine justice. Thus Baha'u'llah was saying clearly that the Sultan would be unexpectedly killed. Finding this unthinkable, Mirza Abul Fadl declared that for him, the fulfillment or non-fulfillment of this one prophecy would constitute a decisive test of the so-called revelation's authenticity. To dramatize his certainty that the prophecy would fail, he vowed to join the ranks of Baha'u'llah's followers should the Sultan's doom occur as predicted. Further insight into Baha'u'llah's meaning came from yet another tablet, in which Baha'u'llah warned the Sultan to guard himself against betrayal by faithless subordinates. He said, He that acteth treacherously towards God will also act treacherously towards his king. Take heed that thou resign not the reins of the affairs of thy state into the hands of others, and repose not thy confidence in ministers unworthy of thy trust. Avoid them, and preserve strict guard over thyself, lest their devices and mischief hurt thee. A few years after Baha'u'llah's banishment to Akka, Ali Pasha was fired from his post as prime minister. Stripped of all power, he sank into oblivion. The first stage of the prophecy was fulfilled. The second came to pass in 1876 when a palace conspiracy abruptly deposed Sultan Abdulaziz and led four days later to his murder. The monarch was betrayed and assassinated by the very subordinates against whom Baha'u'llah had warned him. In some ideal world, Mirza Abul Fadl might have calmly considered this outcome as an intriguing demonstration of Baha'u'llah's prophetic power. In the real world, however, he did nothing of the sort. The unexpected fulfillment so angered and frightened him that when Baha'is reminded him of his pledge, he became incoherent. Nevertheless, the episode cracked his smugness and impelled him for the first time to consider seriously Baha'u'llah's claim. After thorough and prayerful investigation, he became convinced of its truth. Forfeiting his high position, heading one of Tehran's leading Islamic universities, he embarked on a life of poverty and sometimes imprisonment to teach Baha'u'llah's message. His book, The Baha'i Proofs, and a lengthy personal visit did much to help establish the faith in America during the early 1900s.
On August 21st, 1868, Baha'u'llah and a small contingent of followers embarked by steamer from the port of Gallipoli for Alexandria, Egypt. After brief stops at Port Said and Jaffa, they landed at Haifa, where they boarded a sailing vessel for Akka, the walls of which loom just across the Bay of Haifa, visible from the slopes of Mount Karma. The ancient city of Akka, known as Ptolemais in the time of Alexander the Great, whose fortress, the saint jean d'Arc of the Crusaders, had successfully withstood the siege of Napoleon in 1799, had sunk to a level of a penal colony under the Ottoman Turks in the mid-19th century, to which murderers, highway robbers, and political agitators were consigned from all parts of the Turkish Empire. Explicit orders had been issued by the Sultan and his ministers to subject the exiles to the strictest confinement. Hopes were confidently expressed that the sentence of lifelong imprisonment pronounced against Baha'u'llah and his followers would lead to their eventual extermination. The firman of Sultan Abdul Aziz, dated July 26, 1868, not only condemned them to perpetual banishment, but stipulated their strict incarceration and forbade them to associate either with each other or with the local inhabitants. The first night, Baha'u'llah testifies, all were deprived of either food or drink. They begged for water and were refused. So filthy and brackish was the water in the pool of the courtyard that no one could drink it. Nearly everyone was sick shortly after their arrival. Malaria and dysentery, combined with the sultry heat, added to their miseries. Three succumbed, among them two brothers who died the same night, locked in each other's arms. Baha'u'llah sold his own carpet to provide for their burial. These terrible conditions, however, failed to arrest the mighty stream of revelation which, without interruption, flowed from Baha'u'llah's pen. The proclamation of his mission, begun in Adrianople, continued, directed to the kings and rulers who, by virtue of their power and authority, were invested with an inescapable responsibility for the destinies of their subjects. In these epistles, he not only declared his station as the promised one of all religions, but for the first time began elaborating on the social principles of his religion.